We're delighted to uh, welcome Leslie Holmes to the Department of Sociology. As you know, we have lots of interest in, some of us in the Department of Sociology at least, have a lot of interest in Salford and in Manchester for a variety of reasons. Um, the Salford Lads Club itself is a very, very interesting project, and Leslie's going to talk about the background to the project uh, this afternoon. It's a very, very interesting story. Uh, as you know from Leslie's title, there are connections obviously with the world's longest running soap opera, uh, Coronation Street, and of course, uh, the, it's a cliche to say, the iconic photograph taken of the Smiths in front of the Salford Lads Club. But today, Leslie is going to talk about the background, the history, and the current projects that are underway at Salford. It's a very, very interesting job. Thank you very much, Leslie. Nice to be here. And uh, one of my only campus is one of the amazing place. Beautiful ground, you know, fabulous buildings and things, and very different from the red brick streets where I was on yesterday on Coronation Street. Um, my background is I'm an artist. I've been a like, self-employed artist for about 20 years, and I was doing an architecture project about 12 years ago. I was uh, working with uh, young children on the estate, and I was actually interested in stopping them kind of burning down all buildings, basically. And I wanted to, the schools weren't doing much in terms of education about architecture. About the heritage of the area, and so I started to work out some projects about buildings. And the project I wanted to do, um, I was unable to do it in the library because the library had just been suffering an arson attack, like a seventy two concrete building. So I, so we said, why didn't we go to the the Lads Club, which I'd never been in, which is the end of the street. So I went into this building, which first time I've ever been into it. Um, I think I've been once to vote somewhere, um, and when I went in, I was just amazed at this place, it's like something, my dream come true in a way really, it's a kind of perfect building. So I did this project there, um, which was like getting kids to look at where their families came from and how they fit in with the area and things. Um, and then I um, you know, got talking to the people there, and I think it was very basically on the verge of closure nearly. Um, and I went to the first couple of meetings, and all the volunteers who worked there were very keen to keep it going, um, but they didn't know quite what to do. So. Um, I joined them on the team and we started doing open days and we've gone a long way since then and um, you know, this is the kind of result of it anyway. Um, for me it's like a, a bit of a sweet shop really because it's got amazing images from the very first day it opened right up to today. It's got 20,000 um, record cards of everybody who's ever been in the building so it's a remarkable kind of set of images. That's one of the first ones uh, taken outside the club and the interesting thing about it is we don't have, we've got lots of pictures from 1903 or 4, that Edwardian era, but we don't have many of teenagers. So it's a really fascinating glimpse, I think, about what um, um, these kind of kids looked like in those times. Um, so that's one of the kind of unique features of, of the actual club, really, in that kind of setting. So Coronation Street is here, um, and we've got Main Road, there are lots of shops on. Um, all those streets just been built around about that time, about 1900. Um, so it's a very, very new facility for that area. These are all lads, you know, lads or boys clubs. So there's all sorts of variations. And in, in Greater Manchester, it's called lads clubs. So it's not something as a universal kind of title. Um, but they're all working lads. If they were, they were probably about 13 or 14, um, and in 1903. You were probably not in full-time education, but you were working part-time, probably attending school if you were looking. So these facilities were actually brand new for to get kids off the streets, really. Um, and that was a kind of starting point for us. So we got these four lads. And, you know, I've used this a few times where I'm looking at the Smiths picture. Were they the original Smiths? So we don't know. Um, we've got 245 Smiths in the record card, including all the names of the Smiths, Morris, Seymour, Rourke, and Joyce, so it could well be, we don't know. Um, the clubs were all over Greater Manchester. They, they kind of, the movement started in about 1870s, the landscape movement. And it started off in the East End of London, I think, on the first clubs. By about 1868, the movement had kind of graduated a lot more, and there were a lot of links between um, ragged schools and these new agencies called Lads Club. And certainly one of the first ones in our area, I've got a picture of the building because they actually moved the building quite a few times and there's not really left of the evidence of the first ones. 
Um, that's from um, an image of Adelphi last month. It was the first thing Greater Manchester um, and opened in 1886. So if you think about you know, Greater Manchester in those times, there were a massive amount of clubs all over Manchester at that point. So it's a phenomenal rise of these kind of buildings. And in every area, they were funded by different people. So they were kind of voluntary clubs. Often the local employer around there would fund setting up these clubs for working lads. Um, that's Salford Lads Club here. Uh, but they're also in other big cities, Liverpool, Birmingham, you know, Bristol and London, for instance. And this I came across this one last year. It's called the Flory in Liverpool. So if you're in Liverpool, uh, it is well worth having a look at the Florence Institute for Boys. Different kind of name from Lads Club. Um, a bit older than the other ones, and actually it's about three times the size of that. It's funny, funny pictures there. Um, but there are a lot of similarities in the architecture. And Salford Lads Club was one of the last ones to be built, and I think they learned from all the patterns of what these clubs are about and the facilities um, to actually you know, create this um, pattern on there. Um, a couple of things that's really kind of powerful about these when I've been doing a lot of history, you know, I mean, I've come across all the kind of, I know all about Salford Lads Club, but then I've been trying to do some research with Adelphi Lads Club, which was very close to it in, in Salford there. Um, and I've come across these registers, which were in the county record office. Fascinating kind of documents, really. Shows how many kids were actually part of that club in that time. So the need for these places was immediate. You, know, you, were, you were probably getting 1,500 members signing up in that year. So every year they would have a different register. But the interesting thing about it is what we think about young people have got somebody age 10 and somebody age 24 within this kind of club. So not like a kind of, we've got fixed patterns of what youth and communities are about these days, rigid things about between 13 and 17 as patterns of behaviour. But in that time, that was the range that were considered to be young people. Um, also, they kind of kept a record of how many people turned up for those particular evenings. So if you were a youth worker there at the time, it looks like you have to cope. Some nights you might have 48, and then some nights you might have 718. So you can't imagine <laughs> um, the kind of life that was going on there. So obviously Saturday nights, there's some Saturday nights where there are massive numbers present. Um, but I'm not quite so sure what's going on in those particular times. There's no, there's no records of that. But I mean, when you go through these documents, they are fascinating things about what they're actually doing. Salford Lads Club has got a very, very different record system. So for Delft, we had all these registers, one for every year, and they're very hard to trace if you're trying to trace somebody who was part of that. At Salford Lads Club, everything is alphabetical order, and we've actually got 20,000 of these cards, all um, uh, alphabetical index. So amazing things for that club to keep. Um, and these are two very, very typical of early members there. So, um, obviously, like the brothers, um, born in a place called Alderson Lane, um, and they were at the club for quite a few years, from 1905 to 1911, to the board in 1891, 1893. This is a very different kind of register, and the main purpose of it, it was used as like a CV. Because the idea that the, the Salford Lads Club was, it also had a work bureau. So the idea was, you, the kids were coming off the streets, they would do activities. If they kept going and jointly being part of the club, um, after two or three years, they might be doing some volunteering and helping other kids do different things. And they could take these cards along to local employees and get a better job. So the idea of them was to get them out of what were then uh, Victorian street gangs into some kind of more meaningful job, which might give them a better pathway in life. Both of these, when they were left school at 13, work, they, they got, their first job was a nipper boy. And we've got absolutely hundreds and hundreds of nipper boys that are in that club. So it's just the original thing, a nipper. You, just, you worked in a factory or mill, and you just nipped here and there. So it was the most basic job you could probably get. Um, they often then went on to be errand boys. And because of the proximity to Manchester Shipping on the docks, we've got cabin boys and all sorts of different kind of objects. So a fascinating car. They're also double-sided, so they might have been a class at the club, and they also might have gone camping with the club. So they really are amazing records. 
talked about this, I mentioned the street gang idea, and a lot of these clubs were set up in response to, um, there was a lot of press coverage, a lot of uh, interest in Victorian street gangs, which were all in different areas. I don't know if anyone has come across the books, The Gangs of Manchester by Andrew Davis. Anybody aware of that? It's a fascinating publication, um, and I've done some talks to Andrew at various things, and it's looking at, suddenly we were recognising these kind of street gangs in Victorian times, and there were some different things put on to actually um, engage them. Um, so one of the first things that places like South Alaska would do would be organising football teams. And that's one of the first teams from 1903. Again, we know who's in the team, all the names on there. So it's a fabulous kind of record again of that. Um, but then when I was searching through things like there was a, a weekly um, kind of newsletter came out. There was a report about football game from that team um, in about 19... It's not that team, but it's still a team. And it's talking about how this kind of gang behaviour was actually then transferred into kind of sports. So there was lots of... The game had almost been abandoned. There were people chased off the pitch. The fans were coming on. So the, the kind of Edwardian local football was a very, very rough game. We've got loads of newsletters very similar to this one. Um, but they talk about, you know, having had this kind of fighting on the pitch and things. We've disqualified them for two weeks. They're going to get everybody together on the Monday night. So it's very similar to all sorts of bad behaviour you get in kind of football clubs or you, that's good where you bring people back. Um, so, you know, very interesting stuff about um, what happened in, in sports there. This is the area in Salford where um, Salford last club is. We've got Manchester Ship Canal, or River Irwell, at this point here, coming in. Centre of Manchester is here. Old Trafford is down here. And this is the uh, kind of triangle here called the Oddsall Triangle. So that's what happened within about 40 years, 50 years of completion of the ship canal. So this went from being basically farmland into something that looked like, when I first saw the pattern of the street patterns, it just looked like Manhattan. It was amazingly dense. And people came from, um, not from Ireland, not from Scotland, not from different parts of England, for jobs on the docks. So the density of the housing there is absolutely amazing. Um, and you know, within that, the only space there, that was a park, um, but everything else was probably um, solid, dense housing. Streets together, um, lots of industries around. And things like, you know, think there, were, there wasn't much thought about where are people going to play, where are the children going to play. So you know, they kind of, um, they kind of the, the job thing was very crucial to it. This was one of the main streets here, the road called Regent Road, across the ship canal goes over. That's the view from the bridge, early 1900s. And there were cattle driven down, the, or sheep, you know, coming from the docks and things. Huge buildings around, of which this bit here was a giant brewery. It was called Groves and Whitnall Brewery. Um, and it employed 2,000 people locally. Um, and they were the people who put the funding behind setting up South Alaska. These two brothers were part of the kind of Groves family. Um, one was a JP and one was an MP. Um, and they actually put the funding up. It cost about £10,000 to build in 1903. And they were the main funders. Everybody else on the trustees were also local mill, mill owners. So it's very much about a kind of collaborative effort by a lot of kind of local groups there. And they actually were very keen to get a big celebrity to come along. And in 1904, um, nobody was as popular as someone like Baden Powell. General Baden Powell, um, Queen Victoria died a couple of years ago, so you know they, it was kind of like the king wasn't that well known, I suppose, in a way. But General Baden Powell was very, very famous, the big hero of Mafeking and all this kind of thing, and he was invited to do the formal opening. Um, he was also going around the country getting ideas for the Scout movement. So the Gladstone movement had been going for 25 years, and there were lots of ideas which Baden Powell was very, very interested. Um, this is the, the kind of close-up of an area around where the club is now, where we can see Coronation Street, Salford Lads Club, and um, the streets around there. Other big buildings, which were also uh, funded privately, there was a church, which was a copy from one in North Italy, um, with a kind of beautiful church there, built at the bottom of the street. 
And there was also a girls' club. So the lads' club thing, we were going hand in hand. And in Delphi, they had a lads' club and a girls' club in the same building. But in Salford here, there was a girls' institute at the bottom of the street. So very much a kind of model village in a way. Um, and I just outlined this street here, which was one of the, the main streets called Rookland Street. So we've got something to do with that. Um, we talked about the need for it and that there were you know, nearly a thousand members on the first year. But this was very, very dense housing. So right up until 1967, lots and lots of people were living in these dense streets around there. And it was known locally as the Street of a Thousand Children. Um, and we did a project a couple of years ago to do with this street. <coughs> we tried to trace back people who lived in London Street. Um, these four women here were all sisters. And they were one of a family of 16 who lived in one of the houses there. So really dense housing. So the need even in the 1960s for places like Salford Lads Club were you know, really important kind of things. I also part of the project I traced back the jobs that people did who lived on Rudman Street in that kind of 60-year period. And the ones in blue are those are the jobs they did when they first came to the area. So the kind of stuff that were you know, people moved in, they were doing nautical instrument maker, a musical instrument maker, a lamp lighter, a glass blower, there's all sorts of things which are associated with all the industries around the docks. So amazing range of jobs that people are attracted to the area as part of that uh, particular street. The top street is Coronation Street. Um, um, and it was used Coronation Street was the name that took the soap, obviously, but there was a street going off the side of Coronation Street called Clifton Street, and that's where the original pub was, and they used it for quite a lot of episodes. <coughs> um, I've seen newspaper articles like this one from 1967, where it's got the wedding, it's got uh, Len Fegg, Love Stan Ogden, um, Annie Walker, all, and Albert Tatlock all going into this particular pub. So that was in the newspaper at the time. Um, and then it was actually demolished along with a lot of the houses in about 1971, and they actually built the set of Coronation Street there. So it's very, very, very linked to the area. If we look on now to, you know, suddenly coming inside the club, those were, we've got annual reports for every particular year, so what we're going to have to do is trace through different numbers over that period. So it actually peaked before World War I. That was the kind of peak number of members we had at the top of the last of the 1,280. When I was looking at some articles about the decline in populations in places like Salford, there was a lot of uh, kind of depression just before the 30s, and Salford, for the first time ever, lost a vast amount of population. People moved out of Salford because they weren't the same amount of jobs, and that's reflected in that number. So when I was looking through, there was a natural drop, and it corresponded to the kind of statistics I could find there. Uh, we probably kind of dropped down radically by the 1970s when a lot of the streets were knocked down. Um, and, uh, you know, we're getting probably around about that figure, you know, about 1900, and, you know, it's, it's actually going up again now. Uh, so those are 175 of the members of the club. Um, one of the big spaces inside the club is a big gymnasium. And so it wasn't actual four things like football, it was gymnastics, was the main sport of Salford Lads Club right at the end of the First World War. And we've got all these names again on all these shields that go correspondingly right up to that. Took it very seriously, this was from 1930s, and it was an outdoor gymnastics team, and they actually took part in a thing called the Salford Pageant, and they were actually on the back of a lorry performing this exercise. So it um, was quite an amazing kind of feat, I think. About a few weeks ago, we had um, a cheerleaders team in the gym, so it's kind of like, you know, we, it's still got a lot of the kind of architecture, which is exactly the same, um, and so it's been you know, used a lot of the time today. Music was very important to place that self for last one. It wasn't about just giving them sports, it was about actually giving them a range of things. And in the early 1900s, they would have things like a bugle band, a male voice choir, um, jazz bands, and they also had a minstrel troupe. And a picture of Graham Nash, who, if you've heard of the Hollies, sixties group, the Hollies, Graham Nash and Alan Clark are the lead members of that. Actually, were members of Salford Lads Club and learned to play banjo and harmonica as part of the minstrel troupe there. Um, the guy next to him also became a full-time banjo player. 
So there are people who have gone on to do different things, you know, starting from that kind of tradition. Weightlifting boxing is very um, big at the club and always has been. We've got boxers who were at the club in 1900s and they went to box in America. When they came back, they opened their own gyms in West Lats Alford. So these two guys here. Um, this guy here was an ex-professional boxer. He still works at the club and he actually teaches boxing to a lot of the younger people as well. Um, we've had some, quite a lot of filming goes on there, so we've had, we did a film with the uh, Running Me Trust a couple of years ago where they were doing a whole film about boxing. This weird picture here is from, this guy was a member of the club and he won Opportunity Knox in the 1960s by wiggling all his muscles to music. So he was one of the first big winners on that reality TV program. So if you go on uh, Google and put in Tony Holland or Mr. Muscle, you should see a very gory video of him kind of doing this routine. So it could kind of pulsate any muscle in his body to a kind of beat of music. So it's uh, very strange stuff. But um, he was known for himself for last life. So weightlifting was also one of the kind of things that went on. A big concert hall upstairs besides a kind of main gym downstairs and Boys played netball at Salford Lads Club, and actually in the Lads Club movement, right up until the Second World War, when the basketball came from um, America. So it was mainly kind of netball, it was a kind of the, the, what boys played there. Um, so, and that was a picture of a netball team from the 1900s, I think. I do a lot of projects. I don't tend to do much day-to-day -day working with people, but I do special projects. And we did a project a couple of years ago called Swedish Drill, which is again used to take place in the main gym. And it was a bit like very early gymnastics, really, all developed from this kind of Swedish drill. And uh, using these, we use brush handles for that, but they're kind of like wands, they've got magic wands, I think, at the time. And kids really, really liked it. So we'll look, I'll show them some photographs of this project taking place in 1906 in the gym. And kids were really fascinated to find out what the heck this was all about. So we did a really big, we did a kind of performing arts project. Um, sponsored by Claude Foot Foundation, so it was uh, used in the same space. Um, camping has always been a very big part of what this club is about, and um, quite a few other clubs as well. Um, this is actually just outside Salford Lads Club, and they were setting off for camp in 1911. But they were going to the Isle of Man camping, which is a massive expedition in that kind of time. <coughs> They're very keen on posing, not posing this, because there were 240 boys went that year, but there's just a few of them in that kind of shower bang there. Um, so they would take them down to the railway station locally, um, and then they would, they would catch a train to Liverpool, and then they'd go on a packet steam, and that's the actual packet steam. I found all the references to these in the archives, and I've traced them up so we know which actual packet steam was used from Liverpool to the Island Man, and then they would go camping in the countryside in the Island Man. So a major expedition. And they would take some like 240 boys and 20 tons of equipment to go camping for um, about 10 days. So amazing stuff, really, a really big expedition. The other thing is that these were, I say it's not like scout camping, this was about taking boys out of the inner city. The only time of the year they would get a um, holiday would be a Whitsuntide holiday, that was the annual leave from the kind of job search um, And it was getting them, giving them a chance to go on holiday. So, the camps were always oversubscribed. People wanted to go in you know, mass numbers to those camps. So there were huge numbers that actually went camping with the club. Um, and it's something that carries on today. I mean, we just we completed the 100th camp a couple of years ago. And I, like I say, it's not scout camping. Um, you know, the, the kind of motorbikes on the camp in the 30s, um, you know, the great fabulous one from 1954, the Teddy Royal Camp. They're all dressed up in a kind of black ball. Um, hats and things there. So a great range of photographs of the annual camp. So um, they, would, they would go camping in tents, but they would, they would be doing, they'd have a sports day, they'd, do, they'd go to the seaside, they'd go fishing, and all sorts of kind of things which would be part of that kind of holiday. Various things have changed the club radically from, you know, over this period. One of the first things was uh, World War I. Um, the building was actually used as a recruitment centre for the Salford Towns Regiment. So a lot of people did sign up through Salford Lance Club as the building, uh, as a local kind of place. Um, and there were probably about 150 um, 
you know, young people and, and young adults who died in the First World War, associated with sulfur, that stuff. So a massive loss of people, and that's one of the kind of record cards of somebody who was killed in the war. We have a man at the moment who's a secretary there, and that's his grandfather who was killed in World War One. It had a massive impact on the club, because up till that point it had been arranged on a very kind of, almost like military basis, it was very rigidly kind of timetable and set up. After that, the first thing, you know, to, you know, they were starting up a junior club, and the, the junior club came to an end because they didn't have enough young volunteers to run it. So it had a major, major impact on what was going to go on at Salford Lanston. And it became very much a community club from that day onwards. It was no longer this kind of, you know, um, train unit. World War II in that, it, you know, had a big impact, mainly because it, it was around Docks area. The sort of last club is there. It was actually not quite on that, but there was um, a bomb uh, in the Manchester Blitz in the, in the 40s, and it actually hit the girls' club. So the girls' club was destroyed at that point. So we've actually no records or photographs of anything to do with the girls' institute, and I've never, I've never come across them, apart from just that architect's drawing of the building. Um, so, again, massive kind of impact on the club there. One of the biggest changes, though, one of the things that had the biggest impact was the kind of what became known as like the slum clearance of the 60s and 70s. Um, it's an amazing picture. That's one of the most um, incredible pictures I've ever come across. When I've, been, I've lived around there for about 20 odd years. And, uh, one of the first things that struck me was how long some of the streets were. So you knew you were in this massive kind of place. So this street is still there. It's called Robert Hall Street. And when you're on that street, you think you're in a kind of small estate. It stretches for about three quarters of a mile. So you, you knew about the scale of this place. But the scale was, in the late 60s, they actually knocked down 7,000 houses on that estate. So it was a major social upheaval. Think about what the laws <coughs> did to different families. This was, had much, much bigger impact. Um, and what was happening then was all these tower blocks were being built slightly outside or even further afield outside of the main Salford area. So it, again, it changed that whole community um, amazingly rapidly. The only buildings that are left are where the pubs owned them. So they were kind of like, uh, they owned the land and the brewers, you know, held out for bigger deals and things. Um, but the other thing about that kind of triangle of land, it had nearly 100 pubs on that stretch of land. So it was a, an amazingly dense kind of area. And I think the other thing it was, um, there's a lot of um, documents about the kind of mental health problems that came from um, the changes to your environment. And there's a very, uh, one came out in the 70s, and, and all the case studies were, were from this estate, from the Ulster estate. So it's how, when this happens to you and everything around you disappears, you become exiled in your own communities. And it leads to a lot of kind of like major problems, which we, we're very familiar with today. But in kind of those times, what they were doing was they were making these nice new flats where people would go. And for, you know, there was an appeal for, for a lot of people. A lot of people didn't want to move. They wanted to be still on the streets. But for a lot of other people, they also could see the benefits of having a bathroom and improvements and things that had a very, very radical effect on people. Oops, The other major impact was one of the other the girls' club. Um, they, they kind of changed the rules so it became Salford Lads and Girls Club in 1994. The major changes that this has had is that, first of all, all the people who have been volunteering there were all blokes, and I think they were very, very frightened of They didn't know how to cope with the girls' club, that was one of the main things. But also, it was a very big social change because it was kind of getting women into doing the kind of volunteering. <coughs> They were, they were used to looking after families, often a lot of broken families around there, so they wouldn't have a lot of time to do that. So the girls' club has kind of functioned some years and not others. Stephen Wright came back a couple of years ago and took the shot outside, which was wanted to try and match it up with that original one of the lads outside the club there. But the, the other major things about the girls' club, why they're a threat, is they can do things like snook and pool. We had two girls one year, they got, they, they got to the last four in England at snook and pool, which was terrible, you know, boys have been playing this for years and years and winning championships, but for some girls to achieve that was uh, amazing. So, 
They're actually doing all the things that the boys were good at, and they were even better. And they do a lot of outdoor activities as well. They've done, uh, they go up into the Lake District to work with different groups. Um, so there are a lot of different things. And actually this year, the Girls Club is, is thriving really well. It's one that become um, established again. So sometimes it's kind of folded, um, but at the moment it's, it's actually, actually doing very well. And another major kind of change was obviously the, a photograph taken in 1985 by Stephen Wright. That's not the photograph. I'm not using the photograph because we're all so familiar with it, I think. Um, and it's had a huge impact on the place. First of all, when fans used to come, they used to kind of graffiti the, the building and chip bits of um, brick off. So it was a very, uh, kind of very negative influence, I think, to start with. Um, but I think, you know, we've over the years, we've basically, we've, started doing open days and people used to come from different countries in the world um, and it's led to uh, a massive lot of support from all around the world for, for people who want to visit the place and we're actually in terms of UK music tourism now the third venue after the cavern and Abbey Road so it's been a very positive thing and it also raised a lot of money for the club um, so it's kind of it's been you know, welcomed by all the kind of volunteers some of them were around when that first original picture was taken so I think it's got you know, a very a big impact. Um, looking at today, we've got one well, thing that makes it very, very distinctive, I think, is people like this guy here called Archie Swift. He joined the club age 12, and he's now 80, and he's still there. He turns up twice a week, he works in the kitchen, um, he, he, he went to camp a couple of years ago. So th th there's a whole team of them, probably 25 people, who joined as lads and are still benefiting by giving their time back towards that club. What they, what they do it for is that that club changed their life, it gave them positive things to do, um, and they're actually giving that back. So it's very, very different from something like the normal youth service in that respect. Um, obviously, camping still goes on. We do a lot of this kickboxing now, and Thai kickboxing, as well as ABA boxing. And we've got other groups coming in, like junior groups, and we're doing kind of cooking projects with them. This is a project where we got a local chef in who um, does a, a, a DVD of this, and it was showing the kids how to cook very basic <coughs> meals, and then they could take the DVD home and show the parents how to cook. So that was the one of the kind of, it was really, it worked really well that, and went down very well. Um, and also restoring the building. So it's kind of a lot of work's been done. Um, say, 12 years ago, I think it was very much we're in a critical state, and I think we've, we've raised about 850,000 towards saving the building. It's all been spent, and we're trying to continue to do that. Um, but it's you know a very, very unique place, I think, in, in England, and probably even the world, I think, in terms of having all this kind of history and things. So it's something that we're hoping to carry on. Very much an anomaly, I think, in you know, 2012. There aren't many like this, and it's listed as one of the rarest forms of social provision in England. So it's got kind of definite status. But at the moment, this year, for the first time I've been with the club, we've actually got some government uh, grants in, which strangely enough is called Ending Gangs. So it's come the whole circle. It started in 1903 as a response by our local employees to getting rid of gangs, and suddenly governments are getting small pockets, and it's only a tiny amount of money, but it is a, a grant, and it's, it's trying to, um, get this sustained a bit more so we can put on more sessions with the younger age group. So, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Right.